Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. We're going to take a look at some of the challenges facing moms to be in this COVID age. So many things to be careful about and so many decisions, including whether or not to get vaccinated. Turns out there's not one right answer. We'll get into that in a little bit, but we start today with the bane of your existence. If you're one of the thousands who've filed an unemployment claim only to run into any number of problems getting your money, the guy taking a lot of the flack for that is the Commissioner of Labor and Workforce Development, Robert Asaro Angelo. Commissioner, thanks for taking a few minutes with us today. Uh, thank you, David. I want to thank you for having me, and I want to thank you and all your colleagues uh, who have become an important voice for workers in New Jersey uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, but I do have to take issue. Uh, I don't think we're the bane of the existence for the 1.5 million claimants uh, who have now received $22.8 billion uh, in family sustaining benefits. And while we are working every single day to make sure that every claimant uh, is due, uh, receives the benefits they are due, uh, we do know that we have made a huge impact on the economic uh, vitality of the state uh, and the survival of, again, 1.5 million workers uh, throughout the state who had to claim unemployment uh, since the pandemic began. Yeah, well, I was saying you, you might have been the bane of existence for those who hadn't received yeah. such great <laughs> services. But I'll take uh, all right, we put a call out to viewers asking for their questions, and we had an overwhelming response more than any other time we've called out for questions. So a lot of what I'm going to ask you, Commissioner, is directly from and on behalf of viewers. And viewers, thank you for your contributions to this chat. I want to start by defining terms, Commissioner. You touched on this a little bit. So the system uh, was, is a mess that's wrong? Uh, well, let me be very clear. The federal unemployment system is certainly a mess uh, and was not created uh, to handle uh, COVID or quite frankly, any pandemic or emergency of this size. Uh, unemployment system, which is what we are uh, implementing here in New Jersey and across 53 states uh, in the country, uh, was created in 1934, quite frankly, as part partial uh, income replacement uh, for a, quite frankly, a short period of time. Uh, that being said, with, with the federal extensions, uh, and other increases to it, which we all we support all of it. We want all of our workers to get as much benefit as possible, yet it's still put on top of the same infrastructure. I don't just mean technology infrastructure, but regulatory infrastructure, statutory infrastructure. That is the real problem uh, for claimants. I'm not, there's no doubt people have problems getting through on the phone. Uh, people have problems understanding what's on the website. But the big picture problem here is the federal unemployment system. I know when Congress passed the CARES Act, uh, to get money directly into the hands of workers across the country, uh, I don't think they plan for them to have to go through the same uh, hoops uh, and rigmarole, quite frankly, a regular unemployed worker has to go through in pre-pandemic times. And that's been the real problem uh, for the majority of claimants who are still having issues. So 2 million claims, more or less, since March. You say 96% of people uh, have gotten at least one check. What percentage have gotten two or more checks in the past 10 months. Do we know that? Uh, a very, an extremely high percentage. I can certainly get that for you. Over 60% of our claimants have received $20,000 in benefits. And just real quick, on the $2 million, uh, $2 million uh, claimant number, uh, that is the number of initial claims filed. Right. So right off the top of that is over 200,000 who filed a claim again uh, since mid-March of last year. Uh, there's also, you know, there's fraudulent claims in there that we've stopped. Uh, and more importantly, David, uh, even with the CARES Act additions, uh, between 10 and 20 percent of claimants, unfortunately, are not eligible for unemployment the way the system is set up. So it doesn't mean that uh, that large number of claimants have never received uh, a benefit of, of some sort. All right, let's get to some viewer questions. And just a note to those of you who are watching, a lot of your questions were similar to one another. So if you don't hear your specific question, know that we've tried to combine it with some others of these. So. We also want to note that these emails really conveyed the, the frustration, pain, desperation that a lot of people are feeling. Some folks left with zero dollars. So let's start with the thousands of people who are now coming up on their one year of being out of work. Is, if, is this what they're calling the, the benefit year glitch? Uh, well, we don't call it that. Uh, right, right. If, you, if you want to say it's a glitch in the unemployment system, you can call it that. We should also uh, establish that the terms <laughs> that people are going to use may not match right. directly the yes, terms that 
You're going to use it. Go ahead. Don't match with the federal unemployment law. Uh, quite frankly, it's, it, I mean, it can certainly be a glitch for a claimant. Uh, but that is the federal law that when someone comes up upon their year anniversary date, uh, that they have to, at that point, um, depending on what their individual situation is, David, and again, this is why this is so complicated, because every single claim is in a different situation, but generally, they will have to file a, re refile a new claim. But we're working on that. We understand that in about five weeks' time, on top of the fact that the current extension from federal benefits is going to expire weekending March 13th, uh, the week after that, uh, or the week, two weeks after that, is when we had the highest number of claims a year ago. Uh, so we are right now battening down the hatches and doing everything we can, uh, working with our federal partners to try to get as much flexibility as possible for our claimants and automate as much as possible uh, for our claimants to make sure that there is less, quote unquote, glitches. Uh, but it's really just the fact that they have to do that uh, per federal unemployment law. Uh, and that was a problem last year. We, we started seeing it uh, in June, July, when that term came apart, uh, when folks who were exhausting uh, their claim from you know, June and July of 2019. Uh, so yes, we are coming up on a very uh, important and busy time uh, for the for you know 1.5 million claimants in New Jersey, as well as all of our staff. And your point is there that that's set by federal regulations. Absolutely, yes. This is from uh, Anna Marie. I, along with many members of my unemployment group on Facebook, are going on eight weeks without pay, waiting for uh, for the uh, Department of Labor to implement the 11 week extension into their system. This is unacceptable, she says please find out when we will receive our money, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, again, I don't want to be back up for a second. One, I empathize with Anna Marie, whatever issue she's having with her claim. Clearly, I don't want to looking at her claim right now. Yeah. Uh, but the 11 week extension has now been added to all claims that are eligible for that 11 week extension. Now, keep in mind, David, and everything we're talking about on unemployment, the numbers are humongous. So there are 75,000 claimants uh, who we programmed about a week and a half ago now. And within that 75,000, there's still going to be small subsets that have an issue with their claim for some other reason. Uh, maybe their employer contested. Maybe they have some other kind of problem on their claim or they answered one of the questions adversely during the weekly certification. And this is something I talked about a lot uh, last spring, uh, where at that point in time, 40,000 people a week were answering a question adversely. It doesn't mean they did anything wrong, but these are the federally mandated questions we need to ask for weekly certification. Even last week, David, 20,000 claimants a week, 20,000 a week were still being pended because one of those questions was being answered in a way that had to, we had to pen their claim per federal rules. And that's one of the questions further down on my list of six page of questions, but <laughs> why, um, why is that so? I mean, what happens there? Uh, you know, it's a different answer for every claim. Uh, we took the, quite frankly, uh, enormous step uh, last spring, David, of going and putting on our website a basically a step-by-step -step guide on what the answers to each question meant. That is something that no other state has ever done. Uh, and, and we even went further in that to, in order to go to your certification, you need to attest and click a box that you have read the questions and what each answer means. Uh, but, you know, people still, well, one, you know, the, the answer might be accurate to where their situation is, and it might be something where we need to talk to them, whether or not they have different earnings. Commissioner, that when someone, and we got a question on this specifically, someone answered a question incorrectly, but there's no way to go back and fix that. And then the only way they can fix that is to interact directly with someone uh, at the DOL, and then they can't get into anyone. There, there's certainly a problem on that front. Like I said, from the top, getting through to somebody is certainly difficult. However, uh, we've talked to over a million claimants on the phone uh, since the pandemic begun. Uh, tens of thousands a week we talk to. So one, keep trying. Uh, two, and, and I'll back up for a second on, on that, that issue about people being pended by their answer. Uh, every week we run a, a, an automated script that automatically unpens the ones that we feel comfortable unpending. Uh, there are certain ones that we, because of federal law, we need to speak to that person. There's no doubt. And that is definitely a hang up for people. I do not deny that at all. Uh, and we're working with our federal partners. We're hopeful uh, that with a new administration uh, that some of these rules or regulations can be relaxed, like we've been asking for for almost 12 months now to this point. Uh, but in the end, we are a federal program and we are bound by their rules uh, and statutes on this stuff. And I think that we're pretty much, we're walking right up to the edge and pushing the boundaries on this, on this, on this front uh, on behalf of our claimants across the state.
So it's clear that the phones are a problem, the website's a problem, the subcontractors who are doing customer service type work, also a problem. Where do you start? What can you tell people uh, in terms of those, just those things right there that are going to be fixed in the immediate short term? Or is it too optimistic to think that in a, a week or two that that problem is going to be solved? Well, you, you hit on a lot, a lot of problems there, David. Uh, nothing's going to be fixed uh, overnight. But I want to be very clear that we're working day and night to improve everything. Uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, as I mentioned before, we've come up with new automated processes, which we, if we hadn't done, uh, there'd be about 30,000 more people pending a week than there are right now. Uh, we've tripled the number of folks uh, between our own staff and the call center who are working in unemployment in the state. And we're hiring literally every single day uh, in batches of folks to come on board and be trained to be unemployment claims examiners. Uh, with the volume that we have, it is never going to be perfect for everybody. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we are hopeful that there will be um, federal relaxment, relaxation of some of these guidelines, but even that will not be immediate. Uh, there's no doubt, David, uh, that the unemployment system in this country uh, was not made for the immediate direct relief of families during an emergency. Uh, well, we're doing everything we can to make it as easy and smooth as possible for New Jersey workers who are eligible for unemployment. Uh, so you, I, I, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I interrupted you. I was going to say, and that, that comes in all, in, all, in all shapes and sizes, whether it be uh, hiring staff, whether it be changing processes behind the scenes to make them more efficient and effective for our claimants, uh, whether it be uh, we're working on a uh, upgrade system to make sure our claimants have more information about their claims. Quite frankly, David, I know this is a very real problem, as that, and this is in every state, uh, it's hard to get information about your claim. And there's various reasons for that, because every claim is so specific and different, uh, that sometimes the frustration is just that they don't, can't get an answer about where their claim is in the process. Um, we're already working with uh, the U.S. Digital Service, which is the arm of the federal OMB, about making uh, improvements on this front. Uh, we're, we're making changes before the pandemic hit about the uh, program our claims examiners use on the initial claims incoming incoming uh, claim uh, to make more information available to our systems as well as the claimants. So there are a lot of different uh, angles that we're trying to improve these processes from. Uh, and I, we're hopeful that every week we have progress on all of those. We have this question um, from Megan who says that um, the third party customer service reps, who I assume are these kind of subcontractors that you've hired, um, they do not have the ability to extend the claim date year. All they can do is, quote, escalate your issue. And they tell you it can take four to six weeks to hear back. And Megan asked that I press you on how you can proactively extend the claims year to, so that tens of thousands of claimants don't have to call into the agency come March and get a real DOL agent on the line uh, to do this for each person. Uh, as I said before, David, that we are working furiously to make sure we can automate that process for folks. Again, this is a federal system. Uh, we can't do certain things without the federal USDOL giving us the okay uh, to do so. Because uh, if we don't wait for that, uh, we're putting every claimant at risk of mass overpayment and putting our entire unemployment system at risk uh, of being out of compliance, uh, which would be a, obviously a disaster uh, for everybody. Uh, as far as the contract call center, yes, it is correct that the folks at that call center at, at Tier 1 do not have the ability to make a lot of changes to claims or make any changes in, in certain extents. Uh, and that is because the federal rules, well, number one, uh, that a U.S. Uh, that a New Jersey Department of Labor employee, an unemployment employee, has to be the one to make a final determination on a claim. And now when you're talking about extending dates or backdating or changing a benefit amount, those are all final determinations that cannot be made by the call center staff. Uh, and on the, the timing window, you know, whether it's being told six to eight weeks, whatever it is, that is just the generic answer. Certainly some folks are gonna take that long, but certainly some folks are, are gonna be much quicker depending on what their issue is. And again, a lot of folks call the call center uh, when they see, uh, on the, on the, let's just say for example, somebody answered a question adversely in a week, and they're gonna see, oh, your, your claim is not payable at this time, call the call center, and that's, let's say it happened on a Tuesday, but they have, one of, they have one of the answers that we can automatically unpend, that'll run on Friday or Saturday night, and the following week, they will be able to you know, receive their benefit without having to talk to the call center. Where, so in, that, in those cases, there's no wait time, essentially. That's why we encourage claimants uh, to continually uh, check their online status uh, and, and to try to certify during the window because sometimes, not sometimes, many times fixes are made uh, without the claimant taking any action with somebody on the phone. 
You're watching Chatbox. I'm David Cruz, the state's commissioner of the Department of Labor is with us, Robert Asaro Angelo. Uh, commissioner, why is it so hard to hire people? It would seem that with so many people looking, you know, filing unemployment claims that you would have uh, a line out the door of people uh, trying to work there. Uh, David, it's not the hiring people that's the problem. It's the training them and getting them up to speed on the very complex unemployment law. Um, I haven't talked about this in a while, but you know, pre-pandemic, uh, the normal training for a UI claims examiner uh, was a minimum, minimum for the most claims examiners, learning with them, being you know, on the call with them, with somebody, looking at their screen. Uh, I give major kudos to my staff in the UI division who come up with a, a remote training uh, for workers, a virtual uh, that need to be escalated. But as I said, uh, we're continually hiring uh, staff on that front. Uh, we are expanding our call center staff as well uh, to make sure uh, as much as possible uh, to, to, to answer questions about their claims. But yeah, you know, our, our, I give another major kudos to our staff uh, for being able to get 1099s out uh, in a timely manner. Uh, that is a huge undertaking every year for us. We've moved to digital over the past few years so people can go on there and get it that way and then go to our website, uh, nj.gov slash labor to learn more about their 1099s. But we obviously uh, encourage and advise every unemployment claimant uh, to go over what they've received, uh, to talk to their accountants if they have one or eight, whoever their, does their taxes for them, whether it be your, your, your sibling, your spouse, yourself, your neighbor, uh, to talk to them about what the, what the rules and laws are about your unemployment income. All right, so many questions, so little time. We'll leave you with this one, uh, Commissioner. The website, when is the DOL, that's Department of Labor, website going to be updated with real-time information. Your, web, your website, a couple of people here have said it sucks. <laughs> and I'm just quoting others, right. Commissioner. Uh, I understand, David. And I know that uh, in, in 2021, uh, that we're accustomed to websites and technological services being at our fingertips on an app, uh, getting delivery of a, of a product within a day. Uh, state and federal systems are not made that way. Again, I have, I have great hope uh, that in the Biden administration uh, that we're going to have a lot of movement on this front that we're going to be part of in this state. Uh, we've been a leader across the country in calling for UI reform, technological and statutory. Uh, but quite frankly, I put our website up against uh, most other states. Uh, in fact, we have other states calling us, calling our, about how we got so much information on our website. Uh, I think the frustration is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that it's not set up, uh, and for many reasons, and this is the case in most states, to get a lot of specific information about your claim on the website. You know, we're so used to going into our account status on some, whether it be our credit card or e-commerce e and seeing what's going on with our account, where is this, where is it being shipped? Uh, that's just not possible on employment claims, quite frankly, across the country because of all the different rules and regs we have about uh, anti-fraud measures and everything else. All right, lastly, you want to take a minute, Commissioner, to just talk directly to folks who are in really desperate times and uh, just from, from the heart, if you would, uh, to folks who are facing real challenges right now. Listen, uh, I am the commissioner of a department of public servants, about 3,000 public servants who came into this line of work to help people. Most people working in government did it so they could help people. It's not for the pay uh, or, or, or prestige. Uh, it's to help people. Our mission in our department is to help workers, whether they're working or not working. Uh, and we feel uh, empathy and sadness uh, for the situation that COVID has put people in. Uh, we're a department that is used to helping people lift them out of poverty, uh, help them get employment, help them get benefits, whether it be UI or temporary disability or family leave. This is what our department is for. Uh, and while we are proud of the work we've done to support 1.5 million claimants with $22 billion, uh, which is just mind blowing, we hear every day from thousands of claimants who are in a bad way. Uh, and quite frankly, we are doing everything we can every second every night, every day, uh, to get money to those claimants in any way possible. Uh, but we also working closely with our counterparts, other state agencies, if people need food assistance, uh, if people need other kind of temporary assistance, rental assistance, uh, assistance help keep the, the heat and power on. We wanna be there for everybody with a whole government approach. Again, we know that the un federal unemployment system is limited uh, in its goal and purpose. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have every claimant in New Jersey uh, getting every penny they deserve. Uh, and working with them to help them with other services if it's not going to be coming from unemployment. An apology in order, and are you offering one? Listen, I am certainly sorry uh, that folks are in this situation. There's no doubt. Uh, do I wish I could have waved the magic wand 
uh, and known COVID was coming uh, and asked for thousands more staff uh, before last March? Absolutely. And am I sorry that people are in the position? Absolutely. Uh, but I stand by the fact that uh, the decisions we have made uh, from March 15th on of last year have always been with a goal and with the right answer of paying the most people the most money as quick as possible. And there are always going to be people uh, who are not who are left out of that in some form or fashion. But every decision we make on automation, on, on timing, on getting things out to people is always about making sure the most people receive the most benefits as quickly as possible. All right. He's Commissioner of Labor and Workforce Development for the state of New Jersey, Robert Asaro Angelo. Appreciate you coming on with us and taking these questions. Thanks, David. Thanks for all you do. And thanks to all of you for your questions. Uh, let's switch gears now and talk a little bit about the reason we're even having these conversations. It's the global pandemic. We'll start with an update on things in general and then talk about COVID and pregnant moms. Our panel, Stephanie Silvera, is an epidemiologist and professor with the Department of Public Health in uh, Montclair State University. Dr. Diana Contreras is the medical director and OBGYN in Women's Health at Atlantic Health System. And Raven Santana is correspondent with NJ Spotlight News. Ladies, good to see you all. Let's start with you, Stephanie. Uh, in the past six weeks, the World Health Organization says the number of new coronavirus infections globally has dropped by almost half, about 5 million the first week of January to about 2.7 million last week. Is there something happening? You know, I think that we're finally on the downside of the curve that we saw um, the increase from the holidays in part, at least in the U.S., but we are starting to see vaccinations um, and vaccine programs really start to be effective um, in the U.S. and globally. I also think that people are now a year into it, and I think people are starting to really take this seriously. I, we've seen national change in our leadership and how this pandemic is actually being discussed. I think that makes a difference. So we're hearing a lot about variants now, of course, and how they'll uh, test the efficacy of these vaccines and these treatments. Uh, what do we know about, about the variants? So I, I, we know that the variants increase transmissibility somewhere between 30 and 70 percent based on the data that we have. Most of that data does come from international surveillance. The United States does relatively little surveillance on, vac on the variants. Uh, right now, it, the variants don't seem to increase the severity or the likelihood of dying, but any increase in the numbers is going to mean more deaths. So we're about to a new COVID baby boom, I think. I know three expected moms personally, including NJ Spotlight News correspondent Raven Santana, who has done some reporting on this issue. Raven, good to see you. You had a piece uh, specifically about expectant moms and vaccines. You look fantastic, by the way. Uh, uh, if pregnant women want to walk away with a right or wrong answer, and what I learned just from speaking to so many experts is there is no right or wrong answer, and it's really up to the woman to make that decision, but it's very difficult. I mean, women are faced with so many obstacles. I mean, they're they're, the CDC is kind of advising that you make that decision. Um, and, and that's kind of the hardest part of all this is that that decision is up to me. So whether that's right or wrong, that kind of weighs on me and my unborn child. Uh, so yeah, it's, you... it's really difficult. And I really feel for everyone, including myself, um, who has to make this decision. Yeah, as you said, this is a question that you've had to grapple with. Uh, what is that like? And, and have you made a decision on vaccinating? You know, personally, for, for me, I have chosen not to get the vaccine. I just feel like there's not enough data. Uh, that's my personal choice. I just think at the end of the day, women should feel empowered to make a decision and feel you know, supported by that. I think so many times women either are in these situations where they may enter a doctor's office and a doctor may say, mm, you know, that's kind of silly. There's, you know, there's nothing to prove that anything would go wrong. And you kind of feel this pressure to get the vaccine or vice versa, where someone would say, 
oh, you're not going to get the vaccine for your unborn baby. So it's just so tough for women um, to, to make this decision. I, I just, like I said, personally, for me, I've decided not to get the vaccine, but that's my choice. And, um, and I'm confident about that. And I'm lucky that I do have the support to make that decision. All right, Diana Contreras, uh, CDC doesn't give really guidance either way. It says, see your doctor. Uh, what's the advice that you give to expected moms? So, you know, it's a difficult, it's a really a difficult situation. And I think it's really important that people realize that there is no right or wrong in this situation. But it is really important that people understand both sides. I think that's what Raven was talking about. And I think we have to have that conversation. There was a paper that came out today, published in the American Journal of OBGYN, where um, they talked about in the state of Washington, women who uh, actually got were pregnant and had COVID. And the risk was 70% higher for pregnant women to have gotten COVID than the same age group um, of, of individuals. And so the concern is, do pregnant women have a higher risk of getting it? And then we do know that once they do get it, they have more, they can have, especially if they're symptomatic, have more severe symptoms. And that can put both them and their baby at higher risk for bad outcomes. And so I think it's really important that we weigh that when we make that decision. And unfortunately, it is um, really a difficult decision for women to make because nobody can make the right decision for them. And I think the word empower is the word I really believe in. We have to empower women to write, to make their own decision. There was also a paper recently that showed that people were um, objecting to women who wanted to get the vaccine um, and not giving it to them. And that's wrong. I think we have to support women that whatever the decision they make, that's the one that we have to support. And I think as soon as we can get the information out, we need to get the information out. And I think that we have to make sure that the information is valid. There are a lot of rumors and people go to the um, social media for their information and they really need to be careful about that because we get false reports. We get a lot of um, opinions as opposed to really going to the right sources, which I recommend the CDC and the American College of OBGYN's website. On the website, there is an area for uh, providers and there's an area for patients. And so they tried to explain it in a way so that people can understand it. And I think it is a complex problem, but whatever women decide, we need to support them in that decision. Yeah, you don't want uh, Facebook and Instagram to be your only source of information uh, on something as important as this. Uh, doctor, can you talk a little bit about uh, passive immunity for babies and, and what that means exactly? So what we have found is that moms who have had COVID, they have passed the antibodies on to their babies. So it's actually been protective. And we would anticipate the same thing would happen if moms were to have the vaccine so that they could then protect their, ba their children. We do know that babies who are born to mothers who have COVID don't, aren't born with COVID. They're born with antibodies to it so that they are protected from it. That could be an argument for uh, inoculation. There's a, a, there are a lot of great arguments for inoculation. There, you know, one thing that I think um, we have to always remember is that if mom does well, babies do well. If mom gets sick, babies can get sick. So it's really about protecting moms. And um, that's really what this comes down to. And I believe very strongly, it's really about a risk benefit ratio that everybody has to go through and decide, is this something you're willing to take and what are the benefits? And I think that's really what it comes down to. But in all of OBGYN, it's really about making sure moms are, are doing well because moms get sick, babies get very sick. Raven, this is uh, your second child. You've been lucky to have a lot of family support. Uh, mm -hmm. I imagine you're very cautious about who gets close to the baby, yeah? Absolutely, and I mean, you know, to her point, I think that one of the questions a lot of women need to ask is your exposure level. You know, are you a frontline worker? Are you someone who's in close quarters with strangers? Or are you not? Thankfully, um, I have been able 
to have a safe bubble. I am also in the elements, I have to say, reporting. There's been many times I'm out. Thankfully, I do have you know safety measures that I take. You have a social distancing mic. Um, I drive separately from my camera man. Um, so I, I am lucky in that way. But again, I am very careful. And as I get closer to my due date, I do think I may try to quarantine. Um, the last thing I want is to come in contact with someone who may have it and then spread it to me and then, you know, potentially my, my baby. Um, so it, it's really, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but I have been very careful. Um, but then again, you know, David, you just don't know. And that's the scariest part of all this. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you really don't know who has it and you can really get it anywhere. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been a tough journey, but I've been very lucky so far. And so I just, you know, pray that it remains that way, especially, you know, in my line of work. All right. Continued uh, good health to you, my friend. Uh, standard precautions all around for moms, soon to be moms and everyone else. There is a post pandemic world that's just ahead of us, folks. Uh, that's chat box for this week. Thanks to our panel, Stephanie Silvera, Diana Contreras, and Raven Santana. And of course, Labor and Workforce Development Commissioner Robert Asaro Angelo. I'm off next week. Brianna Venosi is going to be here with you. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to get more Chatbox, NJ Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight News. I'm David Cruz for the entire crew over here. Thanks for watching. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.